Hello and welcome to The Wild Wild Death, the show where we talk about all the ways one can kick the bucket in the Old West. Each week, we spin the wagon wheel of untimely demise, and whichever mode of death it lands on, we tell you a story about it. My name is Jack James Busa. I'm Susan Busa Leshner. And I'm Leslie Sidali. Hi, uh, guys. How are we doing today? It's a lovely day here in Austin, Texas. So Susan's my mom, if you didn't get that from the intro. But uh, Susan, <laughs> Susan and uh, Leslie are in Austin, and I'm in uh, New York City. And we are recording uh, via the uh, fabulous internet. So, we need a story. Leslie, do me a favor and spin the wagon wheel of untimely demise and give us a death to talk about today. All right, here we go. Spinning. (laughs) (laughs) What's it going to land on? Wow. It looks like today we're going to be talking about death by hospitality. (laughs) Okay. I've got a story. In 1873, a doctor was traveling from Iowa to Cherryvale, Kansas, but he never arrived. The last place he was seen was an inn outside of town. But when the authorities went to the inn to check what they found turned out to be one of the greatest and most gruesome unsolved mysteries of the Old West to this day. This is the story of the Bloody Benders. Oh, ready? (laughs) Lay it on me. All right, first let's set the stage. Prior to the Civil War, Kansas wasn't exactly a low-key place. (laughs) The pro-slavery and the anti-slavery groups were in violent conflict over whether Kansas would be a free or a slave state. In addition, all kinds of utopian societies moved into Kansas. Each had their own idea of the ideal way of living. For instance, some societies believed that the octagon was the best shape for housing and water cured everything. Okay. That is, until there was a drought and there wasn't any more water. <laughs> <laughs> then there were some other people who sought to make their lives better by silk farming. Uh, I think it was like called silk bill. What is, what is silk farming? Moth. Silk worms? Yeah. But Kansas silk evidently didn't take off because you guys don't know about it. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, you're right. Then after the Civil War, there was a resurgence in the interest in spiritualism. There had been so many deaths due to the war that people yearned, you know, and rightly so, to believe that it was possible. They wanted to believe it was possible to reach into the great beyond and talk to Uncle Pete. All of this to say, unusual behavior was pretty common in Kansas. And that's important to know. So when the Osage people were forced off their lands and moved into the Oklahoma Territory, and land opened up and homesteaders started to arrive, and this included a number of spiritualist families, including a family by the name of Bender, John and Elvira Bender and their adult children, John and Kate. Elvira? (laughs) I'm sorry, with the name like Elvira... They're just setting, I already, like, I can already tell this is going, they're just setting this poor girl up to be a, a loon. <laughs> Look at little Elvira. She's adorable the way she plays with frog tails. <laughs> In the 1870s, southeastern Kansas was pretty much still frontier prairie land. So a few miles outside the small town of Cherryvale, The Bender family set up an inn and a grocery store that catered to travelers making their way along the Osage Trail. And they, you know, they were homesteaders, so they got some land, and they did what settlers did back then. They dug a well, and they planted a garden, and they built a two-room cabin. And the Benders lived in the back room, and they converted the front room into kind of a general store and an inn and a place to cook and eat. 
and all of that. All four benders lived in one room together in the back, so it was small. So they lived in the back, and then the two rooms were divided by uh, a canvas wagon cover. It was sort of like a canvas curtain between the two rooms. Now, socially, speaking of Elrira, the benders weren't very successful. They weren't good socially. The father, John, was known to mutter in a guttural voice that no one could understand, so the rumor was he was mentally ill. But the fact is, he was probably just speaking German. Okay. <laughs> he must be, yeah, he's not American. He must be mentally ill. The mother, Elvira, was so unfriendly that people sometimes referred to her as a she-devil. Oh, wow. Yeah, she would pretend that she didn't speak English because if she didn't like you, she would pretend like she didn't know what you were saying. But really, she was very unpopular. Wait, that's genius. Actually, I'm going to start doing that. I, I know. I was thinking I should use that uh-huh. word. Yeah. <laughs> John Jr. had a habit of laughing for no reason at all. So folks in town kind of labeled him a halfwit. They called him a halfwit. <laughs> oh, no. That's so mean. He's just laughing. <laughs> However, the daughter, Kate, she was okay socially compared to everybody else. <laughs> when she wasn't giving sermons about free love, remember this is 1870s, free love and women's rights, she worked as a psychic and a healer who could talk to the dead. I love Kate. Travelers heading west would follow the Osage Trail, and after a long day's journey, the Bender Inn was probably a welcome sight because I don't imagine there's a lot of hotels out yeah, there. Yeah, there's no Motel 8 on the Osage Trail. The best you can get is the is the terrifying Bender Inn. But can you imagine if you walk into a hotel and they say, here's your room, and the only thing that makes it a room is a curtain? Yeah, and you have like mumbly John and like weird-ass Elvira, and then like laughing John Jr. And Kate's like, I'm really sorry about the rest of my family. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, great, I'm so glad we found this place. Kill me. You know what? Maybe people's, sta- you know, hotel standards were a lot lower. You know, they were just glad to have something to lay down on. <laughs> <laughs> no mint on the pillow. No, they cooked him food, you know, which was, you know, probably, I don't know, beans. That's very nice. <laughs> At that time, it wasn't unusual for people to go west and never be heard from again. Because things happened on the trail. And once people left their homes to travel west, often never expected to go home again. So if something happened, likely no one back home even know to go looking. People back home going, why doesn't John ever ride? You know, because he's dead somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but here's where it got to be a problem. When people from nearby communities started to go missing, It was impossible for people not to notice that and that no one knew what had happened to them. In the winter of 1872, a man named George Lochner and his young daughter were traveling from Iowa to Kansas and they vanished without a trace. The last place they had been was the Bender Farm. Though winter turns to spring, 1873, a well-known doctor named William York decides to go look for them, and he disappears. The last place he'd been? The Bender Family Farm. That's right. And then insert a sound effect like, dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) This Dr. York, this this guy, had a brother. His name was Colonel A.M. York. And I think they also had another brother who was like a senator. But this Colonel York uh, was a powerful guy in Kansas, and he probably deserves a story all of his own, a cast all of his own, because he's quite a guy. But he was someone, York was someone you did not want to mess with. He brought in a posse of like 50 men, and they started going homestead to homestead, door to door, looking for his brother, Dr. York. And Colonel York 
went to Cherryvale and he started asking around. And that's when he learned that York's last known whereabouts was this Bender farm. So he went out there to find out what happened. He's like, what is what? The family admitted and they came to the door and go, hey, can I help you? And Dr. Uh, they admitted that Dr. York had been there, but said he didn't stay long. And they, they implied, you know what? He probably got ambushed by N- Native Americans. Typical Bender family, blaming it on the Native Americans. Even though they had <laughs> just been moved out. Katie offered to use her psychic abilities to find the doctor, but Colonel York wasn't having it. He thought she was like a witch or possessed by the devil. So he goes back into town and starts asking questions. I mean, think about your going out there. They open the door and there's a mumbly guy and a she devil person and a guy that laughs for no reason. And somebody goes, you know what? I can use my psychic abilities to find your, your brother. Yeah, sure. Let me come in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picturing the Adams family and they are, <laughs> they kind of open the door dressed in like these like fabulous, like Dior crazy. Uh, this is not how it was obviously, but in my mind, they're the Adams family. And, and this Colonel opens the door is like, okay, uh, we're going to go look somewhere else, but I'm pretty sure it was you guys. Cause this- well, in my mind, these are some people who are badly dressed and probably <laughs> missing some teeth. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're probably oh. right over that. <laughs> <laughs> so Colonel York goes back to Cherryvale and he starts asking questions. And this is what he learned that the community thought the benders were bonkers. Oh. So he goes back to the bender place. The only thing out there is their family friendly dog, but the cabin is quiet. So he gets some investigators and they go inside. The place is deserted. Inside the cabin, there's a terrible smell and they find some food and the burned remains of clothing and papers, but the benders are gone. The burned remains of clothing and papers. So they they yeah. burned all their stuff? I don't know. That's just what they found. So then on the cabin floor, they find this trap door that is nailed yeah. shut. So what do you do? We're going to pry it open. They discover this nasty, deep, bloody hole with congealed blood in it. It's just. That's where the smell is coming from. Oh my God. Yeah. So then, okay, okay. So then do you keep going? Because if I was there, I'd be like, Well, mm-hmm. yes, they did. Ah. <laughs> Colonel York wants to find his brother. So they check this hole out. You know what? Somebody goes, Pete will go. Yeah, Pete, get in there. He's like, I'm not going in there. <laughs> Stu, you go in there. Anyway, they, they check this hole and there's no bodies in there. Let me just stop here for just a second. There's a terrible smell coming from this hole in the floor. Don't you think that people coming in to spend the night at this place would have noticed that? Yeah, right. Because there's only that little canvas sheet cover. I mean, it's not like a big plate. Yeah, maybe they're like rustling up a big plate of liver and onions to cover the smell. Or they're just like, sorry, John Jr.'s got a bad case of gas. Like, who knows? (laughs) You know, people were used to bad smells back then, though, right? Because nobody took a bath. There was, That's true. You know, they didn't have Lysol. Whenever I'm watching like a period show or something and somebody's like, you know, doing it or something, I'm like, man, they must stink. I know. That's what I think the whole time. It's like there's no deodorant and no one is showering. This must be disgusting. I'm always thinking, did they brush their teeth? No. Uh, no, they did not. <laughs> but the thing is, This is enough to where the investigators of the time period were going, damn. So that must be the worst smell ever (laughs) in a world full of 
terrible smells. They're like, this one takes the cake. <laughs> So they search this hole. Some poor Smo has to go in there and search the hole. And there's no bodies in there. Oh, God. Surprisingly. (laughs) Yeah. They dig around the cabin and and they dig underneath it. And I think I've also read that they kind of picked up and moved the cabin over. (laughs) Uh, But they didn't find anything. So then they dig in the orchard. And that's when they find the body of Dr. York. His head was caved in and his throat was cut. And they, it's so horrible. And then the remains of 11 bodies are buried in the orchard, including this George Lochner, remember him from earlier on and his very young daughter. How young? Do you know? Some say 18 months and some say eight years old, young. Oh my god. And gosh. there's also something like she didn't have, you know, there's some conflicting reports. She didn't have any bruises or anything on her body, so she's buried alive, or she had bones broken. So, anyway, bad, no. whatever it is. They also found the partial remains of bodies, like, you know, bones and skulls and stuff like that in the surrounding field. So they like, yeah, just they were. were they never left the hotel. Wait, isn't that like a line from the Hotel California song? Yeah. yeah. You can check in, but you can never leave. <laughs> yeah. It's about them. You know, it's like the Roach Motel. <laughs> <laughs> so based on the evidence that they found at the scene, investigators pieced together how they thought the Benders carried out all of these murders. So, remember that canvas curtain that divide the family quarters from the general store? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so when customers who planned to stay at the Bender Place overnight arrived, they were placed in a seat of honor with their back to the curtain. And Kate, the social one, would distract them because she was the one with the social skills. And she probably (laughs) offered to tell their fortunes. The customer didn't realize that she literally knew what their future was going to be. Oh, oh you did not. <laughs> you did not just say that. <laughs> While the traveler was distracted by the fortune telling from Kate, one of the other benders would be waiting behind the curtain with a hammer. They'd smash the visitor's skull and the body would be dropped through the trapdoor down this hole into the basement, I guess, where another bender would be waiting to slash the victim's throat just in case they weren't dead. Then the wow. whole family would get together and strip the body of anything of value and then after dark they'd bury the body. The whole cool. thing was pretty efficient and everybody had a job in this operation. Oh my gosh. So you're telling me that this was planned. The four of them had a conversation about who's going to tell fortunes and who's going to use the hammer. (laughs) Did you guys ever wonder the day, like anybody that does crimes like that, you've watched like a movie like Ocean's Eleven where they plan this heist. But this is creepy. Somebody around the dinner table goes, you know what we ought to be doing. Also, how do you bring that up? Like, I'd be a little nervous. Like, I've been thinking. <laughs> um, like, so imagine I go to y'all, uh, or, or mom, imagine like you and I are at the dinner table with, with um, sister, and I'm like, so, like you hear the forks clanking. You know, you guys said I should get a hobby um, or go on a family <laughs> vacation. I was thinking a better use of our resources <laughs> would be to build a fucking trap door and murder people. I mean, you ever notice that people that do crazy stuff have so much energy? Think about pulling a dead body out. And I mean, that's a lot of work. Anyway, must have been awesome for them because they really did it a lot. That's fucked up. (laughs) This was a sensation, obviously. After the murders were announced, People descended on the Bender farm and stripped it clean of anything 
that could be a souvenir. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. The York family then talked to the governor who put out a proclamation, which was essentially an arrest warrant. And it had a reward of $500 for each person. That was a whole lot of money then. But there were no images for people to go by, so people started getting arrested right and left. People got arrested because of anything that looked unusual. And this is all over the country, Mm -hmm. by the way. The things that looked unusual, like being a woman traveling alone with another woman, was enough to get you arrested and suspected of being a serial killer. A witch hunt. Yeah. Eventually, the Bender's wagon was found a few miles away from the home, but the Benders weren't there. For years after the murders, there were rumors of possible Bender sightings, but no one really knows what exactly happened to the Bender family. What? (laughs) One of the reasons it was kind of easy for the Benders to get away with murders was because this was like a community where eccentric behavior could be okay. They were spiritualists and they had seances and things like that. So everybody went, yeah, yeah that's weird. we're but, all kind of weird, you know, but... That's not thing new, right. Once they started, you know, finding the murders, somebody in the community pops up and go, you know, I thought something odd was going on out there because they were plowing when it wasn't planting time. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the kicker. The Benders might not even have been the Benders. According to this article on this site, Legends of America, that was written by a writer named Kathy Alexander, um, Pa Bender was found to have been a man named John Flickinger, and he evidently maybe committed suicide in 1884 in Lake Michigan, but there's also a rumor that uh, Elvira and Kate uh-huh. murdered him because he had fled Cherryville with all the cash. They don't really know. And then Ma Bender, she's a she's a charmer. She got married as a teenager to a man named George Griffith, and she had a dozen children with him, including Kate. And then her husband suddenly died. And someone said a bad place on his head resembling a dent that she might totally have been made so They were really just a bunch of individuals with murderous fantasies who pretended to be a family to attract yeah. less attention. So this John, this John Jr. evidently was a man named John Gebhardt. And this habit of laughing uh, was supposed to be a ruse so they would disguise the how, how smart he really was. And here's another really creepy part. John and Kate were sisters and brother, but sometimes they passed as okay. man and wife, and they were known to have a relationship. <laughs> and then uh. Kate was evidently the fifth child of Ma Bender, and she got married and went by the name of Sarah Eliza Davis. And she worked as a prostitute and, um, I don't know, some other things like that. But they, she pretty much got blamed for most of the crimes. She's got an impressive resume. Psychic and prostitute. Occasional murderess. Yeah. There's also an idea that the Benders didn't even do this. Okay. The story is that Colonel York didn't like this uppity female Kate Bender because she didn't know her place. <laughs> oh. And he called her like a witch. I mean, he really didn't like her, which made her suspicious to him. But there was this violent man who lived close by, and he was friends with the Benders, and his name was Rudolph Brockman, who might have done all of this. Years later, he killed his own daughter, which led some kind of credence to that rumor. So that's the story. We'll have some links on the site, but there's a picture of the field after they found the bodies and things like that. So, um, uh, but you can look this up. You know what? Whenever something like this happens, there's always a lot of rumors and conspiracy 
because I don't think something is the magnitude of this bad. People can just accept that evil is this bad, right? And this is just what happened. It has to be, no, this can't be right. Other things must have happened. I mean, yeah, I could also just see them like doing one and then getting a little carried away and then... I don't, you know. And things steamroll down the hill and it's out of control. <laughs> like, it's like <laughs> very possible. I wonder, was there any guest of the inn that just had a great time and left unscathed and wrote like a five star review on ye old bed and breakfast <laughs> or anything? <laughs> well, there was, I did read about two guys that came in and um, I guess there was some sort of, bench or a counter or something in this space and they felt funny about the table and the curtain so they ate at the bench and then left and then later on goes i got away with uh, my life you know or so maybe they were in a in a gay relationship and the benders were lgbtq positive and did not decide to kill them very possible in the old west i think that's exactly <laughs> what happened honey <laughs> If you want to know more about this story, please visit the links in our show notes and follow us on social media at The Wild Wild Death. See you next time. Thanks for listening. Adios, machachis. Wah. The Wild Wild Death is a 2222 media production.